Um, yeah, I'd right. like to just situate this in, in the bigger framework of what we'll be doing these days. Um, and I always find it so helpful to go back to something that Thomas Berry says about whatever we're doing, it's just so critical to ask ourselves what time it is. What time it is. Not just what time it is, but what time is it on, on, on Earth? What time is it in, in Earth's story? And, um, and so to kind of realize that we're, we're part of this generation of human beings in the present moment who are doing something that no other generation has done before us, and that is that we're actually living at the end of a biological, geological era. So the last 65 million years is, you know, as I'm sure we're all aware, um, is what's been called the Cenozoic Era. And it's the period when the evolution of Earth has just reached this incredible display, this just expression of beauty and elegance and, and regeneration and health and all of the things that are such a part of what were the necessary foundations for the human species in our particular qualities to be able to evolve. But it took all of that for our minds to be awakened through curiosity so that we can be in this circle today speaking about deep time and space. It took a planet this beautiful to, you know, awaken the human imagination. And it took a planet this profound and um, to awaken the feelings in us that would give us the emotional life that draws us into the hunger for intimacy, for oneness, for unity. And this period that has shaped all of humans before us is over. And that's an awesome realization. And um, so no one before us has seen it in a geological, biological era come to an end, which is what's happening by the whole extinction of species and the changing of the chemistry of the air and the water, the loss of biological diversity. And, and so here we are. So why we're really here has something to do with the call that is a call for life coming from a source so much deeper than we even can understand. And with that is this call to be part of doing something that no generation has ever done, and that is actually lay the foundations for the next biological, geological era, which we can't even envision. But that's why we're really here. So those of you moving into a an elementary school that has that as its primary mission. It's just awesome. And no matter what each of us are doing, that's what's really going on. We're laying the foundations for a future that's beyond anything any human before us could ever imagine, both in its the crisis that we're dealing with and the possibilities that come from a new sense of relationship with the whole. So that's really why we're here. And I, I often think, because it's, it's a great privilege for those of us who live and work here as well, um, as, as, as well as all of you who come to join us, because that's what we are. We're a learning community together, to, have act, to actually have 10 days out of our lives with one, one reason to be here, and that is to be heart, mind, soul, spirit involved in grappling with all of this. And uh, we may never get this kind of an opportunity again. Who knows? None of us can be sure of anything, but to have 10 days with no other preoccupation, it's pretty unique. And it's rare when you think of the mm -hmm billions of humans who can't even get bread on into their hands to feed their children. So it's such a privilege 
um, to have this kind of an opportunity. Um, so um, there, there's, there's, there's something I just want to say about the intensity of our time together. You know, it, when, when people are on sabbatical, I get a little nervous because sabbatical, this is not. <laughs> um, you know, because I'm, I'm only teasing because I know you know what you're in for, Geraldine, but I mean, this is not a sabbatical program. This is really a workout. And, um, and, and it's because of the, t- the time is so, is so short. And um, we moved this program. Jean talked about when she first came here to do this. This was a six-week program. We're doing in 10 days what we did in six weeks. Then we reduced it to three weeks to make it a little more available for more people because how many people can get this kind of time? And then we went down to two weeks. And then we went up to 16 days. And now we're down to 10 days. But we're still doing what we did in six weeks, and what for some students who will be coming in in the fall, we'll be doing this for 12 weeks nonstop. So this is an incredibly compressed experience. And um, I'm just saying that at the beginning because I know, you know, I'm just, you know, I know we'll be hot, we'll be tired, we'll be, some days will be gorgeous and cool, and some days may be heavy and humid, and we'll be like, plowing through molasses and but it, it doesn't that's what that's what shows up for us and in spite of all of that you know we're we're about this great work which is uh laying the foundations for a totally new culture and a, a totally new um era in earth's history um so i i wanted to just share briefly um some of the components of what that's really going to entail. And I, I've, um, I'm pulling these, these uh, ideas out of a wonderful uh, preface to a book written by Joanna Macy called The Great Work, uh, The Great Turning. And I don't know if you know a woman by the name of Joanna Macy. She's an author. Um, and she has been working as an activist. She's a Buddhist in her, pra- her religious practice. Um, but she's been working f- since the 70s in community activism. And what motivated her way back then was the nuclear threat. And she's the only person that I've come across who has really had the courage to deal at the level that I think we may deal with often if we are serious about the work we're doing. Um, and to do it openly and to bring it forward. And that's the, the uh, incredible sense that we may experience of, of, of uh, despair, the depression, the dark side that you were talking about, and the, um, the sense that we, we're of powerlessness and paralysis we can often feel in the face of such monumental issues. And back in the 70s, when the nuclear threat was there, that's where she keyed in. And she said, you know, if we don't face these things as a human generation, if we don't, and as individuals, if we don't face them, what happens is that we cope and we adapt, and then we move into a kind of denial that they exist. And when that happens, you move into paralysis. And so her work was going with groups and saying, Deal with the darkness. Deal with the grief. Deal with your rage. Deal with your despair. Deal with the sense of powerlessness in the face of this. Because when you do, you're feeling. And feeling is the critical emotional fire for for what we're called to do as humans, and that is create the future that we really envision or dream. And that's the, th- that's the zest for life. So she's been doing that kind of work all along. And, of course, the ecological piece has been another major, major part of, you know, the, the experience we have when we are about the kind of change we're talking about. I mean, to, to live through the death of the Cenozoic era, 
the extinction of species at a rate that's unprecedented. You know, I, I, I don't know how to cope with that. Most of us don't. It just we, we take it in up here somewhere, but if we really let ourselves deal with it, we could be swept away. So, um, so in this book, The Turning Point, The Great Turning, she talks about what it's going to take that if we allow ourselves to feel, if we allow ourselves to face the difficulty and not run away from it, then that we will have the energy that's needed for the transformation called on. But she says there's really like five elements of this, five components of this. And I'd like to touch them briefly because this is what we're going to be doing through these days. So you'll see a pattern. And, um, and so she says the first thing we have to do, and I think we're probably all very conscious of this now, is we've got to stop or slow down the forces or the powers that are doing the destruction. So I don't know about you, but I'm on that internet all the time, hooking up with moveon.org. And, and a year ago, I didn't even know how to operate a computer. But the, the need now to know that every one of us counts, and our voice counts, our votes count, our ability to talk about it, to influence other people count. And so she said, you know, the, the only way we're going to be able to be there for the planet is to slow it down and to stop it, but to realize that that is the greatest recipe for burnout because you can't just do that all the time, 24 hours a day. It's just too vast, and we'll all just go crazy. Um, and so she, she talks about well, that, that at this point, while we have to be involved in slowing down whatever the corporations, the next piece of legislation that's coming up that's going to give away wild areas for drilling or whatever the, whatever the issue is, um, that we can't take the whole thing on with the burden of being totally responsible. You have to be responsible, but you can't do it all yourself. And she uses this beautiful image of a flock of geese, and she said, you watch a flock of geese where, where they're moving through into their journey. They never let one leader, one person, face one goose face the headwinds for the whole journey. No goose could do that. So when that one that's out there in the head, headwinds gets tired, it just drops back and someone else takes its place. But it doesn't have an identity crisis. It doesn't go into, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm no good, I'm a failure, I'm da-da-da-da-da-da-da. We can't, we can't do that anymore. Nobody can sustain that. And so the need to be in solidarity with the flock, gather the flock together, you know, so she said, but you know, even if we were all doing that, that's not enough for this great turning that we're going through now. So we might talk about this turning of the Cenozoic to the Ecozoic era, or she calls it the turning from an industrial era to a more ecological, sustainable era. We, there's all kinds of language that we can use to talk about this major change. So stopping the forces is not enough. She said, you've got to do two other things. And this is, so this is what we're going to be very clearly focusing on. We've got to be able to analyze the system's reasons for why our human culture is in the, in the crisis that it's in, why we're doing the things we're doing. This is something Thomas Berry says over and over again. Our institutions aren't filled with bad people. They're filled with good people. And if we don't understand what's motivating why they do what they do, then what we do is we look for enemies to blame and we project that out. We've got to look for structural, it's like system, structural, institutional causes for why we're on this crazy, um, going in this crazy direction. But that's not enough just to be able to say what's wrong. She says we've also got to be able to create alternatives. We've got to have, we've got to have inspiring images of possible alternatives to what we're doing. So if the economic system isn't working, what kind will? If nuclear energy isn't working, how do we create solar? How do we 
create the images of what will work. So as activists, as people making this transition, what we're going to be doing these 10 days is trying to understand why we're in this crisis at a structural level and at a fundamental worldview level. But who are the people? Where are the directions? Where are the resources? Where are the models of what can transform us from this to uh, a sustainable future or a more ecological future? But then she says, that's not enough either. She said, There's, we've got we've to find a new context for identifying ourselves and situating ourselves historically. And why she, while she may not be saying the new story can provide that, that's what we're basically saying. And it's why we're looking at the universe as a whole, as the basic reference for understanding what's happening to Earth and what our role is as humans. So this new context will be absolutely critical for the work that we're going to do. And then lastly, she said, she says, but you've got to ground yourself in a, some sort of a spiritual discipline. Because to be able to do this in our lifetime and sustain it for the long haul and endure the failures, the setbacks, the disappointments, is going to take an enormous rootedness in the big picture so that we see the role that we play. And in a way, those, we're going to be touching in on all of those five facets. And it's partially why the intensity of the program. And um, so um, I probably don't have to say more. You got, an idea, you got the idea. We'll be going morning, noon, and night. And, um, and hopefully there will be spiritual generate regeneration in that. There will be time for ritual, for contemplation, for being in the out of door, out in, being in the natural world, which we're suggesting is the primary context for the renewal of our psyches, our spirits, our hearts, our, our, our bodies. And so what time is free is really there for you to move into these 236 acres of absolutely beautiful, beautiful communities of beings. And um, so to, to take advantage of that as best you can. At the same time, I, I don't want that all to sound so heavy because it's so exciting. It's a totally new vision. We are going to be touching into, as you know, touching into energies that are so deeply in every cell of our body because we're connected to the we're connected to the whole so it's it's um